Hi, welcome to the Macabre Emporium. Welcome back to episode six, the Thanksgiving episode. Yep. Like we had said previously, we were going to be doing a bonus episode and a holiday episode, but with Thanksgiving falling in on the middle of the week when our normal release is, we are going to skip this as a bonus, and this will be our regular bonus, not a regular bonus, our regular episode for this week. This is also our second episode when since we have decided to do full week releases weekly yay weekly so this week we are going to be doing thanksgiving related topics i'm going to be doing true crime of course i know big shock i know what are you doing oh i'm sure this is gonna be a big shock to you and them i'm going to be doing the history of the thanksgiving day parade in the victorian era no actually (laughs) no not the victorian period Uh. but maybe i should have looked up in that but now this is i don't think they were that they actually from what i found they weren't that old and this is oh after the victorian period oh bummer can't tie that in um it's gonna be a little bit a brief overview of the thanksgiving day parades and it's mostly gonna focus on the macy's because it's considered the probably most world famous one that there is yeah definitely and um a little bit over the balloons you know probably the biggest star of the parade itself now obviously yeah So, with Thanksgiving being tomorrow, Mm -hmm. what are you thankful for? Um, I am thankful for, you know, you and my life, obviously. Aww. You know, I had to get the correct answer out there. There was, there was no right answer. I mean, it's just, (laughs) it's whatever, but that was cute. I'm thankful that, you know, we decided to jump in on doing this podcast together because, you know, our other hobby that's quite expensive and the distances (laughs) we have to travel to do it, this is, I mean, the amount of... You know, our overhead cost of this is quite high, but still cheaper <laughs> the than overhead it. cost of the vinyls is way more than this. Yeah. God. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I'm thankful for. What am I thankful for? You, obviously. Yeah, good answer. Yeah. 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 I know. <laughs> so original. Uh, thankful that the rest of my family is healthy mm-hmm. and all of them are seemingly happy. Yeah. Which is always nice. I would go into job and all that, but we ain't doing that. <laughs> so what is your, one of your favorite things to eat during Thanksgiving? Oh, okay. Green bean casserole and like just the cheap stovetop stuffing. You said two, but the canned cranberry jelly is my no, favorite. It's fine. <laughs> what about you? Um, obviously, you know, my grandmother's potato recipe is definitely number one. Of on course, that. those are you know, amazing. Yeah. Even though, come to find out from a Facebook group that I was in, that they are actually close funeral, funeral potatoes, potatoes uh-huh. just minus the cornflakes on top. They put cornflakes on them? From When I found out they were funeral potatoes, I'd seen a recipe on that. It's like I looked into it, and then some of them actually have cornflakes listed on top of it, but my grandmother huh. never... Well, way Never to go, made. Grandma, because that's a weird combination, in my opinion. Her yeah. gram- her her grandma's really great. Her potatoes are really good. Mm-hmm. And then I would also say green bean casserole and probably still the top stuffing, but my grandmother was still with us today. Her stuffing would, you know, top the list, but it'd probably be a shock that's all she ever did use, and I wouldn't be too surprised by that, for because she did pretty much do all of it on her own, from what I can remember. Yeah. In a very tiny kitchen, almost half the size of ours. Wow, really? Yeah. That's a tiny kitchen. Yeah. But she made it work, didn't she? Yeah, she made it work, but her kitchen wasn't a straight counter like ours. Hers was U-shaped, so it was more utilized than yeah. ours were. So maybe her counter space was a little bit bigger just by shape and design, plus had their table. Anybody's cupboard sp- or <laughs> counter space is bigger than ours. <laughs> <laughs> like, we've got no counter. We- no. Uh, let's see. So... Have you ever gone and done any Black Friday shopping before? Yes. And I hated it. Yeah, I did it one time and then never again. Yeah, it was a one and done for sure. Mm-hmm. Like, you already know that when I'm out, if people are walking slow or walking right in oh, front yeah. of me and walking slow or they're, I keep getting bumped into, 
I get really mad really easily. Yeah. Black Friday is the worst place for somebody like me. Oh, yeah. The one time that I actually did go do it, it was quite interesting to see because it was at Walmart and everywhere it's like floating around the electronics department, you know, for the televisions and whatnot uh -huh. at the time. Uh, consoles really weren't as well, they were popular, but not like how it is now for Thanksgiving. Yeah. But like this pallet of TVs rolled by and a third of the electronics department emptied out once they saw the pallet of TVs going to, up towards the front. Did get what I wanted to, you know, I did get what I went for. Yeah? Yeah. It was a digital camera for my mom. Ah. Because the one she had had just taken a crap and she wanted a new one. Gotcha. And then I also did a Black Friday shopping for myself one time because I couldn't pass up the deal that I had found. For yourself? Yes. <laughs> What'd you get for Christmas that year, David? <laughs> it was Windows 10 <laughs> for like $60. Oh, yeah. And that's probably when it had just come out, too. It was shortly after that. So, yeah, when I saw that. It was pretty cheap. It was out there for 60 bucks i'm like i cannot pass that up <laughs> yeah no no especially you being as into computers as you are yeah. like that that would have been stupid to pass up yeah so so with that said yeah this originally it was going to be you know about macy's parade and black friday but when i started looking into the origins of black friday they're not as exciting as the fight videos you get i come on the internet like the day of the day after people beating the shit at each other over a four dollar toaster <laughs> world the, star yeah, world star <laughs> we're not gonna <laughs> film in landscape only portrait oh my god <laughs> those used to infuriate yeah. me so yeah like i said fighting over a four dollar toaster that they don't need in their life uh, yeah it's like and the big thing is all that shit you can order online on cyber monday basically and not have to deal with that shit yep but what I did find more interesting when I was looking into the history of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade was about their balloons. And it just, once again, I fall on this rabbit hole. Holy shit, that's neat. So this is going to be going over the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade a little bit. And I'm going to go into a little bit more about the balloons. So with that said... Obviously, when you hear the term marching bands, enormous balloons, and floats, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade probably comes to mind. Yeah, of course. The Macy's Parade might be the most famous of all these parades held on Thanksgiving Day, but it is certainly not the oldest. It's actually in tie with the second oldest Thanksgiving Day Parade held in Detroit, Michigan. It was created by the J.L. Hudson's Department Store, now named America's Thanksgiving Day Parade. J.L. Hudson would be rebranded into Marshall Field Stores in 2001, and they would be acquired by Macy's in 2006. Okay. The oldest Thanksgiving Day parade belongs to the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That was started in 1920 by the now defunct Gimbel's Department Stores and is now named ABC6 Don Dunkin' Donuts Thanksgiving Day Parade. The Macy's and Detroit Parade would be formed four years later after the one in Philadelphia. I know there are more across the country, but these are the three oldest that I laid the ground that laid the groundwork. For this holiday tradition, I will be focusing on the Macy's Parade as it is the most famous of all three. Yeah. Now, I'm sure you may have caught on that all three of these were started by department stores. Uh, these department stores would use these parades to celebrate the holiday shopping season. And when I was looking into the f origins of Black Friday, which, like I said, mm -hmm. became quite boring. The only real interesting information that came out of it that it had started in the 1950s and there was an unwritten law with advertisement with stores that they have now broken as of november 1st with them now is that that this time period that it was a unwritten rule with the department stores to do not use advertisement for christmas until after thanksgiving uh man i wish i wish we'd go back to that you know because i hate literally the day after halloween you start seeing oh, christmas yeah. shit all over the place Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like probably like actually I think I might have seen one or two on fucking Halloween. Oh, probably. It's fucking stupid. And there's supposed to be a war on Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> the war on Christmas is to get to push it back to, you know, the time period that it, you know, it belongs in after Thanksgiving. Right. No, we'll just skip Thanksgiving altogether. Yeah. And then I've been seeing shit about Thanksgiving is a is a day, not a season. Christmas is a day and it's not a season. <laughs> yeah. I've seen people try to argue that as well too and halloween is also not a day it's a lifestyle yeah that's true <laughs> so 
1924, Macy's would open their flagship store that would take up an entire city block, branding it the world's largest store. The size of a city block of Manhattan where the store is located would be 900 feet long and 264 feet wide. That's pretty big. Yep. Um, I really couldn't find anything in the calculator to give you an idea of something of how big that really is. It's giant. It's probably like a couple football fields long. Oh, wow. I should have like figured that out, but yeah, I'm not a mathematician. If anybody, you know, wants to put that, you know, figure it out for uh, us in our group, go ahead and put it in there. The first parade was originally named Macy's Christmas Parade. According to Macy's interactive timeline about the parade, which you can find on their website, which is quite super cool to watch. A group of employees that were first generation immigrants to the United States wanted to hold this parade to give thanks and celebrate their newfound freedom and the coming of Christmas here in America. The original parade route started at 145th Street in Co- uh, Covent convent avenue and then would end at 34 broadway ending at the macy store this route was approximately six miles but the entire parade session was only about two blocks long the parade route today has been reduced on the two and a half miles but it's still like a very long parade yeah but that's also because they take breaks and bring in like performers to sing on the street right. you know the well street and like it's a three-hour event now because obviously as something in popularity grows it gets bigger um, the very first parade didn't actually consist of much in its procession as it does now. The very first parade had f- only four marching bands. Possibly some jazz bands were thrown in there as well. Some of the videos I'd watched had mentioned jazz bands. And that was even from Macy's website, but I couldn't find them. Four marching bands? That's it? Four marching bands oh at the time. Oh my god, there's so many marching bands now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> I looked into it. There was like 12 total a year uh-huh. on that. And they also have to apply two years ahead of when they actually want to perform. Wow, really? Yeah, so the ones that wanted to per- perform this year, they had to put their per- their application in in 2020. That's crazy. Yeah. They just have such a long line that they have oh, to yeah. get through of people wanting to do this? Or yeah, what? yeah, and one of the local marching bands here has actually performed at least six times in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Six times? Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. The one you told me, right? Okay. Yeah, the one that's closest to us. Okay, yeah. Uh, there was four or five floats. Uh, once again, sources were didn't very consistent. Uh, Macy's said five. I should go really go with Macy's because they literally have their own historians and whatnot for as large as the store is. I would say so, yeah. Uh, these floats were the old lady that lives in a shoe, Little Miss Muffet in Red Riding Hood, Three Men in a Tub, and Santa at the end. But seeing the videos and whatnot from this time period it's like i don't really think you could center santa at the end as a float the way it would look i mean it was not like as the elaborate as the one that they have was now. it like him just sitting in the back of a car yeah but look it was very crudely made to look like a roof of him in a chimney uh, with like fabric okay. and stuff like that but yeah um the floats at the time were you know drawn by horses mm-hmm. at the time because they probably didn't really think this was gonna really take off so they probably didn't put a whole lot of effort into it like they do right. now um parade participants were macy's employees which they still do today and is a special honor as well later on that i'll get into the other section uh-huh. and also santa claus has brought up the rear of the parade except for 1933 for some unknown reason and i couldn't find why he actually led the parade this year instead of ended it that's weird mm-hmm during this first parade, the historians for Macy's said that the spectators that joined actually joined in on the parade and sang along with Santa Claus as he traveled down the parade route following behind him singing Christmas carols. Uh-huh. So whatever song Santa was singing, they were singing the lighter right along with him. Um, they are unsure about how many people attended the parade, but the estimate is about 250,000 people attended the first Thanksgiving Day parade for Macy's. And that's a lot. Yeah. Especially back then. Yeah, and also in the pictures that I saw looking up for this, they didn't like the streets weren't blocked like they are now it's just like the people line the streets with the regular traffic going on behind them oh wow uh, when they would actually reach macy's department store santa would you know get out of the slow wagon whatever they you want to call it um this is where he would be crowned king of the kitties as they put it and they would also reveal their christmas window displays for that shopping season king of the kitties that's what they're like of- kids or kitties as in like cats as in children little chitrons he's the king of the chitrons oh no 
Carol Baskin. Uh, in 1927, this is when the Macy's Christmas Parade would become the Thanksgiving Day Parade. And this is also where the balloons, probably some people would say the real star of the parade, are, are introduced. Uh, these balloons were introduced into the parade because in the 1924 parade, they actually had animals on loan from the Central Park Zoo. They had camels, donkeys, elephants, and even fucking tigers. That's okay. I remember you telling me something about that, but then just the fact that they had tigers back mm -hmm. in the day. Like, that's kind of terrifying, especially with no roadblocks at all. Like, right. there's nothing to like, separate I the tiger. I tried to find out if these tigers were in cages, or if they, which I hope that they were. I'm sure they weren't being super stupid so. about it, but, you know, assumption everybody believes about the past i mean it was dangerous but i would think that he would have some of these dangerous animals like tigers in a fucking cage so in 1927 that's when they changed from animals to the balloons because uh macy's was getting word that some of the children were being frightened by the roars and other sounds that these animals were making oh yeah so that's when the balloons first started showing up and they also weren't filled with helium like they are now. They were filled with regular compressed air. So they weren't on the ropes floating above as well as... They were just being held up and not floating on their own. Yes. Okay. Um, they wouldn't be filled with helium until the next year. And uh, it was also to believe that Felix the cat was the very first of what they would call a character balloon. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Was He was the very first one, but he actually isn't after using historical footage and photographs and documentation. Uh, the first character balloons were to show up in 1927, the same year the balloons came out, would be a from a comic strip called The Cats and Jammer Kids, which was about a pair of twins that defied authority, basically. Oh. So, like, Precursor Dennis the Menace kind of type of comic strip. Times two. Times two, yeah, double trouble, basically. <laughs> Um, Felix the Cat would actually be in 1931, was his, the most famous character balloon. Would make a new appear, reappearance in on the 90th anniversary of his first appearance. But what was the first? The first appear, character appearance was the Cats and Buyer. The what? The Cats and Jammer kids I just mentioned. Cats and, okay. They're the first character balloons. Oh, it was kids. Like, they yeah. actually made, okay. Yeah, they were a character balloon of these kids from this comic oh, strip. Oh, okay. Also, in the 1930s, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, they would actually introduce four balloons that had a sound effect to them. Is it like when you air let, let air out real <laughs> slow from a whoopee cushion? Please tell me it was. No, but now I'm imagining <laughs> that as being one of the but no, it was not. It would be the <laughs> loudest and longest fucking whoopee fart ever. Oh, my God. Okay, sorry. Yeah, now all I can think of is like an Ace Ventura cartoon <laughs> bent over with making whoopee cushion sounds, basically. Yep, you're welcome. And now the, these sound effect balloons that they had was a Dotson hound dog or a wiener dog that would bark, a pig that, that would make squealing sounds, a giant crying baby, Ugh. which is bizarre, and a hissing alligator balloon. And that didn't scare the kids? Yeah. Here's, here's this like 70 foot long alligator balloon that's actually hissing at you, but but that's okay. I don't know. The past is weird. <laughs> yeah, you're telling me. So speaking of weird, this is actually where it starts to get a little bit weird with the balloons itself. Okay. Uh, the first time that they were had these balloons, they didn't deflate them like they do now. They were originally designed to release their helium at an altitude of 2,000 feet with a specially designed valve that they had in them, uh, creating a short tradition in the, for this area known as the Macy's Balloon Chase. Macy's would offer a gift card to somewhere between $25 and $100 as a reward for the retrieval of their balloons, which equivalent to about $1,700 today. Damn, really? Yeah. Fuck, inflation on two levels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you're doing there, being, <laughs> being punny. But they would have a return address affixed to these balloons, and by 1932, they would actually stop releasing these balloons after one pilot tried to retrieve one of these balloons by plane, but he would only receive $25. Macy's decided to ban the retrieval by plane after this first guy that did this. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the following year, two different pilots decided to say, fuck that, we're doing it anyway. Then they tried to gather up another balloon as well, and uh, they almost crashed. And it, it was a student pilot and <clears throat> their instructor, and thankfully they switched seats after the plane stalled out. And about 250 feet from the ground, the pilot got the plane back in level before they hit the ground. Eey. Yeah. So Macy's caught word of this, and they stopped doing it all together after Mm-hmm. after that second incident because they don't want to have their gift to the city of New York ruined by somebody's death, basically. Right. Um, some of the other balloon retrievals that I can actually find is one was known as Tom the Pig, and he floated around the Empire State Building for a couple hours before he landed in <laughs> East Ellis, which is part of a town, uh, part of Long Island. Um, after reading all these, I kind of pinpoint where these all at. these all floated off into the long air island area basically so these are all the locations they're in or around the long island area uh fritz the dotson which is probably the same one that actually barked he was rescued by a tugboat in the east river george the drum major would be torn to shreds by a mob of spectators and 82 spectators would try to claim retrieval with their pieces i mean the probably, probably didn't really specify how much of the balloon had to come back. Oh, true. Uh, Wiley the Redbird would be rescued 22 miles away on a section of Long Island called Fire Island, which is a national park. Mm-hmm. And he had enough helium in him to stay in flight for approximately 72 hours after the parade. Jesus. Uh, Macy's had made the decision if he was not claimed by the following Saturday after the parade, they were going to have to issue warnings to ships in the North Atlantic shipping lanes. That there could be potential, like, <laughs> giant shit falling from the sky. Yeah, no, <laughs> the, the interesting with our la- episode last week about cryptids is just, would there have been a cryptid that would have came, like, been discovered because of this giant fucking red bird balloon floating oh, over God. the Atlantic Ocean? Probably. It would have been great to see the hear well not see but hear what the legend of, you know, the Long Island Redbird or whatever it would be right, fucking called. Right. David had your children's would have to come out of the hall or something out of, <laughs> out on a time suck episode <laughs> over that. Uh, these balloons were made solely by Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company until the 1980s, and then they moved production in house. After that, with the Macy's Parade Studio, after they created it. It would take approximately 25 employees to start in April to construct these balloons in between design and all, everything that goes into them and have them completed by Halloween. They're constructed of polyethylene, polyurethane rubber and made in chamber sections. So that's if these balloons get snagged and get torn open, they are still going to be able to fly unless mm-hmm. there's a catastrophic tear in the chambers. The original balloons were a composite of polyurethane and cloth. But over time, they went moved straight to rubber. Uh, this is one of the more interesting facts that I found out about them. The balloons are hand painted after they are inflated for the first time. Oh, so all the stretch is already mm-hmm. out of them. Oh, OK. This that makes a, sense. Yeah. So this is to prevent cracking and also to check for leaks after it's first initially assembled. And when they are completed, they're shipped, you know, they're packed up in their, con- their shipping containers and whatnot after while they're stored at the studio. Uh, the night before, which is actually a um, kind of a pre-holiday tradition for the New York area, is to go watch the balloons be inflated. Oh. Uh, they are not actually inflated all the way since helium will expand as it warms up. So they are under pressure for what they're designed. So when they are in the sunlight, the helium expands and then they expand mm-hmm. up the rest of the way. And that's why some of them look wrinkled on certain a little bit parts deflated, of the, yeah. and the parade drop because they are not fully inflated because the helium hasn't expanded fully yet. Um, it takes approximately 90 minutes to fill one of these larger character balloons, but it also takes only 15 minutes to deflate them with the giant zippers they have sewn into these chambered areas. Macy's department source is actually the second larger, largest consumer of helium in the world behind NASA and the U.S. government. That's crazy. Yeah, I that's mean, so much helium it, can you imagine standing at the entrance to where all the helium goes in as it's like deflating and you're just standing there talking like this the entire time that would be that, i never really thought that's maybe something i should have left would into. Be great <laughs> like why do all you fucks sound like mini mouse sorry <laughs> <laughs>
And to sponsor a balloon, if you actually would like to see one in the parade, you have to pay Macy's $190,000 to cover entry and construction of your balloon. And it's and every year after that, it's $90,000 to have your balloon featured in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. That's crazy. In 1958, there was a helium shortage, and they got creative on how to keep these balloons in the parade. So they went back to the original compressed air and they had cranes travel the parade route holding these balloons up. I'm sorry, why? There was a helium shortage at this time. Oh, okay. I'm a, I must have missed that part. So I'll have a picture for it listed. In, you know, I do have a picture of it so you can get a better idea of it. Okay. I'm sure at that one point in their life that maybe somebody has wanted to be one of the on one of these balloon crews just so you could say you've done it because it probably could be considered a bucket list thing. Um, but unfortunately, this is a special honor that's held for Macy's employees only. And also, as well as their friends and their family, they can be balloon handlers. So this is a legitimate, you got to know someone to know someone to get into this. You have to be grandfathered in. You don't have to be grandfathered in. It has to be, you have to know a Macy's employee to become a balloon handler. So And, every, and I'm sure that they would have to verify that so that you couldn't just, right. any random person be like, Hey, I know that that oh, I'm sure there's a whole Mike plot. that works at Macy's. Let me let me yeah. in the parade. Um, it's mostly Macy's employees from you know Eastern Seaboard area, but I'm uh-huh. sure if any other Macy's employees like could possibly do it if they really wanted to pay their way to New York to with proof, probably. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, if I was working for Macy's, I would just want to do it at least once just to say I can do it. That I oh, did. Pro- yeah. Well, hell yeah. Just so I can say that I did it. Yeah. Uh, the ropes that the balloons that keep the balloons under control are actually called bones. Bones? They're called bones. Can't Couldn't find why they call them bones, but that's just the name they gave them. Okay. Uh, the crews that are known as the balloon handlers or wranglers, it takes approximately 50 to 90 wranglers per balloon, depending on its size. Okay. So you may not have the answer to this from everything that you read, but like, what is the biggest balloon by size yeah by size i actually do have that in my little bit of fun facts okay so keep that in mind like what is the biggest balloon and how many people did it take I to carry that balloon there wasn't any it didn't say it didn't say because the one of the balloons you're gonna be a little surprised on its size okay the team of each balloon includes an overall handler a uniform nypd officer one pilot, two drivers, and the required number of handlers that is for the, p- the balloon, depending on its size. Uh-huh. The pilot is constantly giving directions to raise and lower, speed up or slow down, and be a hype man to keep up the spirits of the balloon handlers. The pilot also does give its directions with a combination of whistles and hand signals, probably because of crowd noise. It's going to be yeah. easier to hear, listen for that. And notice hand gestures and hearing somebody say speed up, slow down. Yeah, because I imagine it would probably be pretty expensive to get them all like Secret Service earplugs, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, but, we're veering off course. Go a little left. But if this is working, why change it? Right? Yeah. That's how it's been done, I'm sure, it's since a, the beginning. Yeah. Uh, these handlers are typically dressed in a themed jumpsuit associated with a balloon. So SpongeBob is going to look like SpongeBob, mm-hmm. Kermit the Frog is going to look like Kermit the Frog, you know, so on and so forth. But the pilot, the pilot is in a white jumpsuit for a very obvious reason. What? What's the, sorry, what's the you obvious reason? see the reason? pilot easy, easily see the pilot. He doesn't blend in with everyone else. Yeah, because they usually wear brighter colors and he, yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, these balloons, they are also tethered down by two utility vehicles, similar to, you know, the great big giant ear gator one that we drove for the festival that we yeah. volunteer with there's two of those that tethered to each balloon as well oh i'm not sure if that's because of what how they did with covid or if that was a safety measure after an incident that i'm going to cover i would say it's probably out of precaution um it's probably after precaution after one of the incidences that i did find out that didn't happen yeah now a little fun mishap of a balloon tearing and Barney deflating and having to be actually I'm put gonna, out of his misery. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to hold on to that in a, for a minute <laughs> before I ruin that. Um, to be a balloon handler, you must be 18 years old, have a minimum weight of 120 pounds, 
That's the minimum weight a balloon handler can be is 120 pounds obvious, for an obvious reason. You float away. Um, yeah, because in some of my research during the 1927s, there was like a photograph of one of these balloon handlers 10 feet off the ground when they're trying to fill it. Whee! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. You have to have a minimum weight of 120 pounds or way more than that and have to be in good health for obvious reasons. You're walking two yeah. and a half miles trying to hold down a monstrous balloon from floating away that across the sky. That doesn't want to be held down. Yeah. Jeez. And also the a pot, the pilot also has another requirement that's kind of seems a little insane, but with the incidences, it'll make more sense. Mm-hmm. Um, as a pilot, you are have to be able to walk backward for two and a half miles of the parade route, knowing where you are at all times. Well, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the balloon pilots, they must also attend classes in aerodynamics, geometry, and physics. It makes sense to be able to know when to speed up, slow down, raise the balloon, oh, lower the balloon. Yeah. Uh, these balloon crews, they would meet together in the first week of November at what Macy's would call Balloon Fest, where the pilots and these handlers would train with their specific balloon outside for the first time. It's basically what it is, is they're in a big, giant open field making circles for the most part learning how to the best way to control their balloon and whatnot so the pilot can get familiar with their crew and so nothing happens. But like as I said, pilot requirement of being able to walk backwards might sound a little bit insane, absurd, yeah. whatever you want to call it. But there is for good reason why, because there has been two balloon incidences that led to major changes to the way the balloons are handled in the Macy's parade. Uh-huh. Uh, in 1997, the cat in a hat had crashed into a lamppost and causing falling debris to, tr- to strike a spectator, fracturing their skull, and then would leave them in a coma for a month and injuring four other spectators of Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Dang. And this brought on regulations for the balloons to be no bigger than 70 feet tall, 40 feet wide, or 78 feet in length, and when monitoring along the parade route would be implemented in the following year when these balloon regulations were actually put into place since I actually said that wrong. This was all put, these were all put in the same year. Okay. Um, these wind implements, uh, wind regulation implements would be monitored by the NYPD by computer, actual on-site officers measuring for it. And if the winds exceed 23 to 34 miles per hour, since multiple different sources said both of these i decided to put it in a range of that and or heavy rainfall is going to happen they are prohibited from flying the balloons so it would just be a balloonless parade yes the parade would still go on there just wouldn't no be any balloons. balloons the balloons would not be able to would be prohibited to fly oh i mean i mean it, it makes sense and also in 2006 another new regulation sort of happened and um, this would cause to Limit the height of how high the balloons, but I couldn't find a specific height on how high it is. So they regulated the height twice? No, they regulated the size of the balloons and what the wind speeds can be. Because the way grid buildings work, they create a wind tunnel effect, with, which amplifies. Right. So it could be, oh, let's say over the, uh, I think it's the East River that's near it. I don't remember my New York geography. Uh-huh. It could be like a 15 mile an hour wind gust over the river, but downtown by Macy's, it could be 35 because of the amplification of winds of the Greek uh, city grid style that New York City is built on. Okay. Uh, In 2006, the new regulations on how high the the balloons can fly per size. Okay. So this is changing per size because the balloon that I looked at this is that I looked it up. It's fucking huge. What is it? It is actually the M&M's hot air balloon. Oh, well, I'll show you a picture of it later. Yeah, I don't think I've seen it. And you'll probably remember once I show it to you because I can't remember them being any M&M no. balloons until I saw this one. OK. So in 2005, <clears throat> a similar incident to like the cat and hat wind gusts yeah. and everything. It injured two sisters that were spectating the parade. One source said that they got a lifetime supply of M&Ms after this happened, but I couldn't <laughs> find any score i couldn't find any other source that said that not even Mm -hmm. the fandom page for the macy's thanksgiving day parade so it could just be bullshit clickbait article on stuff but 
It's like, sorry about our balloon about killed you, but here's a lifetime supply of chocolate. Here's some diabetes. Yeah. A task force was created on this incident. It was found out the balloons were flying too low. Oh. So now there's a regulation on how low and how high the balloons can fly per balloon size. But I cannot find any information on what the regulation is on that. Okay. Um, now, also, before the because of this second incident, uh, Macy's will now inspect the parade route looking for any obstructions being light posts, street signs, trees, and they will get with the city of New York and they will have those either altered by being turned in opposite direction for the day of the parade or they'll be removed altogether if possible. That sounds like so much work. You now, when... This is like probably one of the biggest events of the city of New York has every year, tourism wise, money wise. Millions you're, of people you're, down you're, there, millions of people watching on TV. Yeah. yeah. And that many people coming to New York City to interject, to inject money into their economy. You're going to do what you're going to do to, you know, yeah, keep this going. True. And the, there is a long list of incidences with the balloons where they're being torn and whatnot. And, but those two are the most well known in the parade's history. And. Most of the incidences were tears and property damage due to wind and rain when I looked through the list. One of the more amusing ones that I found was in during the 1990s, like I started to tell you, was about Barney. Uh-huh. So it just I found it amusing because all I could picture when I was reading through it was a picture about how this whole incident went down. So during the parade route, Barney got tangled up in a tree and got torn. Okay. So yes, Barney the Purple Dinosaur. He got entangled into a tree and got torn open. And to help get the balloon off the parade route, New York police officers ran up and started stabbing Barney with the pocket knives that they had. <laughs> and in the months oh. of crying children and cheering parents oh is how God. the article, re- you know, put it out there. As, really? Yeah. Kids were crying and parents were cheering. I mean, I would have too. <laughs> Cheered, not cried. Yeah. It's, but damn, dude, they were up there. Fatally yeah. wounding fucking yeah. Barney. And also, if I remember correctly, it was in 1958, the Popeye balloon. The parade was held during a heavy rainstorm and his hat was collecting water. And because of the wind, his, hat, his entire balloon tipped in one direction. And they estimated it dropped about 50 gallons of water on the crowd <laughs> below. Oh, no. And you know it was cold as shit, too. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, mid-November. Yeah. In a wind tunnel. Yeah. That's quite great. So, some of the fun facts to close this up. Fun facts! Fun facts! I probably should just sound clip that already. (laughs) The only time the parade has been canceled was during World War II. And Macy's would donate the balloons towards the war effort, weighing in at 650 pounds total of rubber. The parade would return in 1945 with a new route, and that half the size of the original now. This is when the two and a half mile route is now in place. Okay. My first thought about reading that, though, was I thought it was COVID. That was actually a pre-recorded, was they used pre-recorded footage of the parades before. Well, some of it was still from that year, but they was a, they went crowdless and part of it was mostly pre-recorded at the time. Uh-huh. Um, the Rockettes are an iconic part of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, but they didn't debut in the lineup until 1958. And they are the last act of the pre-parade festivities. Well, yeah, because it's like right after that that Santa shows up, mm-hmm. so. No, Santa's at the very end. The Rockets perform before the actual parade starts. Oh, I thought they were at the end. Nope, they're, they're Rockets. So they open the show then. Yeah, they are pretty much, oh. are the, they're the last of the pre-parade, but they are also the opener. Ah, okay, okay. I would more likely say, they, in my opinion, I'd say they're the opener of the parade besides the New York Police Department Highway Patrol yeah. on their motorcycles coming in. Wee-hoo, wee-hoo, wee-hoo. Yep. Uh, the parade was first televised on a local New York station in 1945, and in 1948, it would be televised for the first time nationally on NBC. Uh, NBC would go on to be the official broadcaster of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in 1953 and has been since. Yeah. Today, it is estimated that about 50 million people watch the parade at home today. The original Miracle on 34th Street was showcased the parade and filmed on location, so they only had one shot at the scenes when they were filming this. Also, actor Edmund Gwen portraying Santa Claus in the film would be the Santa Claus in the parade for that year as well. Aww. Snoopy uh, from the Peanuts cartoons has made more appearances in the parade than any other character balloon since he debuted in 1963. Nope. 
1968. How many times? This will be his 43rd appearance and oh. has hate had eight different costume changes over the years from anywhere from an astronaut to the fighter pilot Red Baron that he's most known as. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, when President Kennedy was assassinated three days before the parade, uh, there was a possibility that the parade was going to be canceled, but in f- Kennedy family reached out to Macy's and said, please keep the parade on for the sake of the children. The coldest Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade was in 2018. At 18 degrees. Ugh. God, can you imagine? Like, just wind chill straight to the bone. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Oh, no. And in 1933, on record, was at 69 degrees as the hottest Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. But that would be, like, perfect. Yeah, yeah. But then again, in 1933, I don't think everybody had air conditioning to go run into afterwards. And But 69 is not that warm. But... This is in a major urban area, so it's actually probably higher than that from the sun, all stone work and concrete absorbing heat. Oh, you so nerdy. <laughs> the, the wettest Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade was in 2006 with a rainfall of 1.72 inches. That's a lot. Mm-hmm. Tom the Turkey, even though I didn't go over floats because they weren't nearly as interesting as the balloons the balloons were but they do have a size regu- min- uh, size regulation to fit through the lincoln tunnel that would be reconstructed later oh uh tom the turkey he is actually the oldest macy's thanksgiving day parade float and his debut in 1973 and has been in every parade since then i actually like this one little clip from an article on their response when they're asked this question uh-huh Macy's will not disclose how much the parade costs them each year. And the only response that they will give, it's a gift to the city. And as with any gift, you don't leave a price tag on. I like that. Yeah. Uh, There are estimates that I did find online, but after reading this response, I decided to leave it out. Yeah. And leave it the way it is. If you want to, if your curiosity wants to know, go find it. Bring up your Google foo. Mm hmm. So that's the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and their major stars, the balloons. That's awesome. I could have gone over like performers when they all came in, but it's like any celebrity basically that's been alive since 1941, I think is. No, that would have been in World War II. No, it wouldn't have been yet. This is the late 30s, early 40s. Don't remember exact date. Mm-hmm. There's been celebrity performances in every Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade yeah. minus 2020 being live so i decided to leave that out and i even looked for my birth year uh-huh. and your birth year <clears throat> not a single name i really recognized they include really? any so none not that i can remember off the top of my head at the time i was reading it oh so yeah that's it for macy's and the balloons and uh, their parade that that was good you did a lot of you spent a lot of time looking at balloons and the mm. history of yeah. balloons <laughs> like and the thing is like you started with one direction and yeah. then you went the complete opposite direction. And it was probably the best thing you could have done. Yeah, because that first original direction, I don't remember how it got brought up or where we were is when it popped in my head. Uh-huh. And then, yeah, and I started looking into it. It was fucking terrible. Yeah. It's like the history of Black Friday. It's like one Wikipedia page. And I was like, eh, no. it's probably not very long either. It's not. Huh. Yeah, it was actually quite boring. It's not as exciting as I thought it was going to be. This was good. I like this. Good job, babe. Thanks. So I'm doing, as I stated, true crime. Uh, This is about a family Thanksgiving dinner gone wrong. Yay. Let me guess. It was caused by a debate about the politics or religion. No. No. Okay. No. Because, you know, that's usually the most common things that start thanksgiving fights is debating politics or religion no sir not this time my mother hated going to thanksgiving when my uncle rich would be there because that's all the man ever talked about politics yep and religion no just politics that's all i can remember ever being or any time spent around that man that's all it was was about fucking politics all the fucking time Jeez. so my grandma the one that you met Mm -hmm. uh my uncle the one you met didn't like he didn't like turkey uh didn't like the traditional thanksgiving dinner right so every year my grandma ordered pizza for dinner (laughs) for them yeah 
All right, so you ready yeah, what to hear about shirt? this fucked up uh, Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah. Okay. On September... Nope. <laughs> <laughs> this Thanksgiving dinner in September. Did he, it's did Canadian. You, did your dad fucking plan this? <laughs> Here, we're going to go to Golden Corral on September 24th. It's 11 a.m. as soon as they open because I don't want to stand in line. <laughs> <laughs> much <laughs> fuck me god okay on sunday november 29th 1998 the pravaki family was preparing for a late thanksgiving dinner 18 year old seth was getting ready for dinner in a different way than his family mm-hmm. his brother was watching tv while waiting for his girlfriend to show up because his girlfriend was going to join them for dinner okay. their dad had gone to pick up their grandpa and they were on their way back already his mom was showering in preparation for the day. Seth had been upstairs loading a 22 Ruger, R U G E R yes, Ruger, that's okay, that belonged to his dad. They all woke up that morning excited to spend another holiday together and enjoy a feast. None of them knew that this day would end in murder. Right. According to neighbors, Seth was seemingly a good kid. They all say that. Oh, well, he was such a good kid. He was very kind of polite. He was, he was a quiet kid, but he was, he was never a troublemaker. Right. Until so, he decided to kill, like, you know. Anyways. Right. It kind of goes back to an old George Carlin skit that I remember. It's like, it's always the quiet ones you got to watch. He's like, no, I'm going to watch the guy that's banging a machete on the bar screaming. I'm going to kill the next motherfucker that walks in the door. No, I'm keeping my eye on him. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, fair point. About a year before the events that I will describe to you took place. Seth had a a couple of run-ins with the law. Like, he was arrested twice. Once for shoplifting a CD. That was a thing, apparently. And Well, it's still shoplifting no matter what it is. I know, but this this really dates it by saying he shoplifted a CD. Yeah. Um, And another run-in was for him shoplifting beer, which hardly anything to write home about. However... This was a precursor to being sent to a youth home for 10 days, being forced to take therapy, and being prescribed Wellbutrin. I was taking that at one point. Okay. So now I'm going to kind of get into what happened that day. Keep in mind that the next part takes place on November 29th. Okay? Okay. This would start around noon, but nothing would be found until nearly 12 hours later. So it'd be pretty right by the time anybody showed up. Around midnight on the 29th, April's parents, April was the brother's girlfriend that was coming for dinner. Uh, They showed up to look for her since she didn't show up to her third shift job. Her employer called her house and that's how they found out. And then they were like, oh, fuck no. And they went over to Mm -hmm. the Pravaki home. They got worried. So they went there to see if she was still there when they got there. They claimed to have seen a shadowy figure run from the garage into the house. They also spotted a man's body lying in between two cars in the driveway of the Pravaki home. They went towards the garage and saw blood on the floor and a young man run run out of the house and disappear into the night. They called the police immediately after that because they knew something was wrong. Obviously, there's a body in between the cars in the driveway. There's a shadowy figure running around too, so... Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. (laughs) my god oh if you didn't know david's a tiktok queen no i'm not (laughs) oh okay so when police arrived and entered the home they found the bodies of april boss which was the brother's girlfriend 78 year old jonathan pravacki which was seth's grandfather Mm -hmm. they were both in a small room in the back of the garage seth's 19 year old brother jedediah was found in the basement and his mother linda was found upstairs in the bathroom where seth had shot her as she was getting out of the shower the body in the driveway belonged to seth's father 50 year old stephen autopsies later revealed that all five big victims had obviously died of gunshot wounds that's clear all of them were shot once and died instantly except for the grandfather he was shot twice because the first shot didn't kill him i'm assuming these were all shots to the head i'm assuming is what he went for um yeah Even though technically you can survive a shot to the head, but... Well, this family didn't. It all depends. Well, since he is using a twenty-two, I want to say as small as that is, it's probably shot them in the head and it bounced around on their skull for the most... 
ooh, they rattled like mm-hmm. marbles. Shortly after the police arrived, they were met by a teenage boy walking out. This would turn out to be 18-year-old Stephen Wallace, and he would go on to explain what had happened. Stephen was a friend of Seth's and had gotten a phone call from Seth earlier in the day. Seth told Stephen that he had killed his mom, dad, brother, their grandpa, and his brother's girlfriend. Seth had asked Stephen to come over and help him clean up the scene. He wanted help moving the bodies and getting rid of the murder weapon. I don't care how, you know, much of a friendship I have with somebody. Uh-huh. If you call me you're like, hey, I need help moving bodies. <clears throat> nope, fuck that. I also, 911. Yeah. Okay, bye. Gotta go. My mom's calling to do the dishes. <laughs> right. Right. Stephen agreed to help him. Yeah. He tossed the gun in a pond miles away from the Pravacki home, and he said he was there helping clean when April's parents came over. This automatically turned into a manhunt at that point, you know, because right. where the fuck is Seth? Mm-hmm. We found Stephen, the help. Right. Where's the main guy? The high school that Seth and Stephen attended was the same school that Seth's father taught at. Well, it wound up being put on lockdown in case uh, in case Seth were to show up. Pictures of Seth were shown around the school and handed out in case a student happened to see him, you know, walking towards the school, in the school. Um, that way they could alert staff. Okay, so they were all found the next day, Monday, right? They were found... 12 hours, yeah, because it would have been a little after midnight, yeah. I believe, when okay. their bodies were found. Okay. No, okay, now the lockdown makes more sense. I mean, yeah. Well, either way, they still, they didn't have Seth. They would, would have been looking for him. Right. Okay, so during the day at this high school, all those attending found out about the death of Jedediah and his girlfriend, April, even though they had graduated the previous year. They, You know, they still have friends there. Right. Uh, It made for a sad day. So sad, in fact, for one student, Genevieve Simonelli, that she had drove. She left the school and drove around just because she needed, like, to be by herself, I guess. No. I didn't really say why. Um, During her drive, Genevieve saw someone hitchhiking, young and dumb. She pulled over to pick them up. Once the person got in her car, she realized it was none other than who? The hat man. Muffin man. God damn it. No. (laughs) No. This is a macabre podcast. It's not going to be happy people like the muffin man. Come on now. It's going to be Ingrid Cole or the fucking hat man or some shit. Or Sasquatch. Sam Squatch. Anyways, so it was Sam that had gotten in her car. Like Sam from Trick or Treat. Okay, I'll fucking stop now. Did I say Sam? (laughs) Jesus Christ, his name is Seth. (laughs) Wow. So yeah, it was Seth. Uh, Even though she was terrified, she took Seth to his friend's house where he had asked to go. It wasn't to Stephen's house. His friend was not home, so he went and hid in their pole barn until about 1 p.m. the day after. So this would have been on the 30th. Thankfully... Genevieve figured she should probably open her mouth and be like, yeah, the dude was just in my car. So she told the police where he was. The police went to the pole barn, got him out, arrested him. After being taken to the police station and interviewed, Seth confessed everything he did. He told the officers the story about a fight he had had with his dad and his dad telling him that he needed to move out. Mm -hmm. So being stupid and young... Because, you know, you know everything in the world at that point. Oh, yeah. And being angry because his dad, you know, is done taking Mm -hmm. his shit, basically. Out of anger, he got the gun and decided to kill his his entire family. Once he did that, he got rid of the shell casings and decided to call his friend Stephen to come help him move the bodies and bury them. When Stephen arrived to help, they both soon realized that simply moving the bodies was too hard. So they had to try and make it look like a robbery gone wrong. Yeah, we're still moving bodies to make it look like a robbery gone wrong. The, I don't think they got them very far. Obviously, mom was still left right. upstairs in the right. bathroom. So I'm assuming they lived in a somewhat <clears throat> rural area. If they was able to pop off that many people and nobody had yeah, called the police I'm, then. I'm assuming. I didn't find anything out about loca- well, location or no. where. This all took place in Muskegon, Michigan, though. I don't know if I even said that in the beginning. I don't remember. I don't think I did. Anyways, so they were both in the process of taking things out of the house, like the TV, the VCR, the stereo. Mm -hmm. 
uh, to make it look like they had been robbed. And this is when April Boss's parents showed up. So I found a timeline of events that came straight from the Muskegon Chronicle. Okay. So I'm going to go down that super quick. All right. Noon on the 29th. After an argument, Seth, who said relations with his family had been deteriorating in the previous six months, is told to move out by his dad. Seth, an 18-year-old at the time, he was a senior at Reith Puffer High School. He decided to shoot his family. 1230. Pravaki goes upstairs to his father's closet, grabs his dad's 22 caliber pistol, inserts the clip, and goes downstairs, hiding the pistol behind his back. 1245. Stephen, the dad. Mm -hmm. leaves to pick up Seth's grandfather, John, in Roosevelt Park for a belated Thanksgiving dinner. Shortly after that, Seth walks behind his brother, Jedediah, who was 19 at the time. He was sitting on the couch watching TV. Seth shot him in the head, the back of the head, and then drug his body into the basement so no one else could see it. Like, if mom was to come downstairs, she yeah. wouldn't have seen. I mean, there had to have been blood. All over that couch. So, 110. Dad and Grandpa return back to the house where Seth was waiting. He claims he didn't know his grandfather was coming for dinner, but he shot both men in the back of the head in the garage as they were heading to the door. He shoots the grandfather in the head a second time because the first bullet didn't kill him. 1.15 p.m. Seth goes upstairs where his mother had just gotten out of the shower. He entered the bathroom and shoots Linda in the back of the head. 1.20. Seth comes downstairs as April Boss, Jedediah's 19-year-old girlfriend, enters the home. She walks into the kitchen and Pravaki shoots her in the back of the head as well. He claims he didn't know April was coming for dinner either. I, have, I don't know. I feel I'm like he... I'm surprised he was be able to shoot this many people... Yeah. In this long of a time period. But also, yep. it could also, if this isn't like a rural part of Michigan, this is probably in the middle of deer season, but it might not be rifle season at that time. It could yeah. Be I'm not sure. I know there's specific seasons mm -hmm. for each type of hunting. And Muskegon's not a small city. Oh, I know it's not, but it could be still in Muskegon address because you yeah. know like we don't live yeah. where live we live we're not outskirts. in the city limits of there but we are a city resident there right but even though with me saying that they might play it off as you know outside noise from from hunters or whatever whatever but, a car backfiring as it drove but by as close as it would be you would know that's like inside the fucking house or yeah. near the house unless they lived you know by them not by themselves but Away from everybody else. Okay, right. so... Continue on. 2 p.m. Seth calls his friend Stephen Wallace, also a senior at Wreath Puffer, and according to Pravaki's later confession to police, he tells Wallace that he killed his family. He begs Wallace to come over and help him clean up. Wallace, Stephen, uh, right. goes to the home, helps him wrap the bodies in sheets, and they plan to bury the bodies later. 6 p.m. Wallace attends a church youth group party and agrees to return to Bravaki's home afterward. So he went from helping sheet dead bodies and putting them on mm -hmm. pause like, I'll come back after my, my church youth group party to help finish getting rid of your family. <laughs> yeah. So 11pm. Well, this goes from 11pm to midnight. So Stephen returns to the home and they decide the bodies are too heavy to bury and they try to simulate a robbery. But as they're moving furnishings, April's mother and stepfather, Julie and Tom Cooper, pull into the driveway because they're concerned that their daughter didn't show up to her job. Seth and Stephen flee the home and hide in the woods. So that's where Seth went to, apparently. No. November 30th at midnight, Tom and Julie Cooper, April's parents, <clears throat> they got a hold of the cops and then they said, fuck it, we're going over anyways. They show up. See the guy, well, the shadow run into the house mm -hmm. and then later on see it flee off into the woods. 7.15 a.m. Gen Genevieve Simonelli is, this is when she leaves to go on her drive. Damn, that early in the morning school's already started? What? Like you've already found out about the death of these people and you're like, it's too much and you leave on a drive? 7.15 in the morning, that's so early. Mm. 7.15 in the morning when I was in high school, like I wouldn't have even had time to get in the school yet at that point. 
Right? Yeah, I don't think... I don't recall if we started that early here or not. It just seems really early to me. It was 7-something when we started, but I don't think it was that damn early. Yeah. December 1st, 1998, Provaki and Wallace each are charged with five counts of open murder. Wallace's charger charges were later reduced to accessory to murder. May 27th, 1999. Seth Provaki would plead no contest to the charges that were laid out before him. He was sentenced to five life terms in prison without the possibility of parole after pleading no contest to all five counts. To all five counts of first degree murder. And he was shipped off to Kinross Correctional Facility in, I don't even know how you say this, Kinkalo? Kinchalo? Somewhere in Michigan? I've never seen this name in my life. It's about 275 miles north of Detroit. You want me to spell it for you? So you can look it up real quick while I read this off. Hold on. Okay, go for it. K-I-N-C-H-E-L-O-E. Yeah, it's probably Kinchelo. Kinchelo? Kinchelo or something like that. Okay, anyways. So, Stephen Wallace would be charged with being an accessory and disposing of the murder weapon. He would look at facing upwards of five years in prison if he was convicted. November of 1999, the ruling was tossed out. November 1st, 1999. Stephen Wallace is acquitted by a jury. October 30th, 2007... At this point, being, you know, 2007, Stephen Wallace is now 27 years old. Mm -hmm. And he's sentenced to prison for 28 months to seven and a half years for violating probation on a June 2007 felony conviction of receiving stolen property. Previously, he was convicted of vandalism at age 19, domestic violence at ages 22, 24, and 25, and attempted resisting and obstructing police at age 24. July 15th, 2010, three inmates, Andrew Ross, inmate number 504582, Brian Davidson, inmate number 458405, and Seth Provaki, inmate number 289400, tried to escape from prison. The three somehow overpowered the Michigan State industry semi-driver that was at the prison. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so they overpowered the semi-driver at the prison just a little bit after 9 p.m. Um, they partially crashed the truck through a double chain link fence. Partially because the truck got stuck on the fence, so they didn't make it all the way through. When this happened, it caused the three inmates to jump out and take off running in any direction they chose. And unfortunately, they didn't get to go very far and two were apprehended immediately. The third took off running, not heeding the warnings from the armed guards, and was shot and killed in their attempt to escape. That day just so happened to end with the sweetest poetic justice. Can you guess how? Shot in the head? Yes. Well, he was shot. I don't know if it was in the head. It didn't say. But yes, it ended with Seth Provaki being 30 years old Mm -hmm. at that time, being handed the same... Or being dealt the same hand that he dealt his family. He was dead at the age of 30. Stupid fuck. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I just really liked that he wound up dying by gunshots when that's what he did to his family. So I hope he suffered a little bit. Or a lot of it. And... Uh, Depending... Well, most law enforcement are trained to shoot for body mass, not for head... Not by PlayStation, which would be headshots, so... He more likely was shot in the back <clears throat> first before anything else. Eh, could have been. But, like, if you've got armed guards, like, yelling at you, stop, don't move, we'll shoot, and you keep fucking moving, like, you kind of kind of asked for that. Yeah. But, yeah, that is the tale of the Muskegon Thanksgiving dinner murders. And when you first started reading this off, I can't remember the name of this one that I have considered for our Christmas one. Uh-huh. Uh, is it a is it does it take place in Utah? I don't remember, but I just remember the guy he went into around taking his family out while dressed in a Santa Claus costume using a very very unique weapon that I don't want to bring up now because I want your reaction to it. Unless it's one that I've already got listed. I don't I that's the problem. I don't remember the name of it and I don't want to <clears> say what he yeah. used. Okay, so we'll we'll figure it out some other time. Well, it, 
I want to say it was an episode of Dark Topic with Jack Luna that I heard it on, and I don't remember. And I think it was at a time period when I was listening, trying to find the shows that I like. So I was listening like fucking everything. everything. <laughs> right. But there's also one for the Christmas one, if, if I do true crime, that that was fictional. And it's actually a real fucking thing that actually happened in between here in Chicago. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, do you know? Yeah, because we talked about it in the kitchen like a week ago. Oh. Wah, wah, wah. Well, Anyways. Oh, well, it'll be a surprise to them, but not yeah. you. No, but I didn't know that it was a real thing either. So it'll still be a surprise to me because right. I don't know the but, whole thing. But like I said, I got to see how much information I can find out at first. Right. So anyhow. Join us on all the things. Oh, so we're not going to be aggressive this week. That's good. Two weeks in a row is fine enough. Social media. Okay, so we're going for three. Yay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Social media. Uh, join our Facebook group. Just search our show name. Follow us on Twitter at Macabre Emporium. Follow and subscribe to us on YouTube at Macabre Emporium Podcast. Because you can actually customize your channel names now. Yeah. So it's at Macabre Emporium Podcast. Uh, shoot us an email. Let us know how we're doing. Constructive criticism is always welcome. Share a local case of the macabre or the weird that you would like us to research for a possible episode. Macabemporiumpod at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. That's all the things. And then you said like follow scripts. Like, share, rate, follow, subscribe, hey, all the things. Yep. Definitely if somebody's looking for podcasts, throw our name out there first before any other. Yes. And please leave us reviews on each episode so that we know like the shit sucked. Let's not do it this way again. Right. Because all the reviews, any possible emails, it'll help us, you know, still fine tune what, you know, things that we're doing. Yeah. Even though, like, it still could turn into true crime with you and history and origins with me, maybe. And then, I don't know how else to put it. A grab bag episode, but, you know, since the ghost is jumping on the counter, maybe a clearance bin episode. I want to, I want to tease at that very, very last one on the board over here. The very bottom one? The very bottom one. So we have a super, super awesome episode <laughs> that we've come up with. Well, not we. I'm sure it's been done by others, but I don't right. know. Uh, that'll be coming out on December 28th, the very end of the year. Um, and it'll be kind of like our thank you for listening mm-hmm. and sticking with us this long. And see you next year. Yeah. Ha! But there's a lot of there's gonna be a lot of fun stuff in that one. Yeah, I'm excited to do this one. So well, I, that one. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not really see you next year. There will be an episode, you know, every week after this. So. Well, no, that's why I said December 28th. I know, but you said so. On you. that one, we can tell them see you next year. Yep. Because there won't be another one in between that one right. and the following year. Okay. So anyhow, <laughs> I'm starting to think it might be time to close up the Emporium for today, Sarah. What do you think? I agree. So until next time, remember to creep it real. Okay, bye. Bye. And being yum and yum, yum, (laughs) being yum and dumb.